because I want you to learn and I want you to hear a lot of this. The, the series that we're going into, and here's what you're going to notice. I am on a, a, an assignment to align every campus we have for continuity. So you're going to notice that we're all going to be preaching the same thing for the rest of the year. If I'm preaching it, every campus is preaching it. And we're discipling our people in it for continuity. We don't just want something to go, grow big and wild. We want to refine this thing and make sure that we have quality around the world and keeping true to our New Testament assignment. So we're all preaching and saying the same thing. So every campus is preaching this series called Undercover. And it's based upon Psalms 91 and several other things where the Bible talks about whoever dwells under the shadow of the Most High shall abide uh, in the secret, uh, under the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Most High. We're dealing with these principles and each of these principles have laws to them. First of all, honor has laws. We're going to be dealing with the laws of honor. We're going to be dealing with the laws of favor. There is not a black person in America that don't need a favor. And so I'm going to be teaching y'all that favor, you cannot cheaply access favor. Many people are frustrated because they want favor that they do not have. So they spend years believing for favor as if there's nothing they can do to get it. No, you don't pray for favor. You live for favor. Daniel didn't pray for favor. He behaved for favor. So there is a way to figure favor out. Uh, so we're going to be dealing with the laws of favor. We're going to be dealing with the laws of promotion. Favor, honor, promotion. So you want to be able to study with us these things because you're going to learn some things that you didn't know. And you're going to learn some things that may be affecting you. A great majority of you may be suffering from the consequences of dishonor unaware. And because honor is a law, its consequences are only reversible by replacing dishonor with honorable habits and behaviors. And so honor is the way to the favor of God. And so we have to learn what that looks like uh, on every level to our superiors, to our peers, to those that we work over. There is a such thing as an honorable posture and an honorable behavior. And we have to know what that is and how to live that out. So we're talking about this because there is a global, well, uh, maybe not global, let's deal with this, a cultural, it's an American issue, which is why I have to open this message this way. Sorry, I'm so rude to all of my visitors. I love y'all so much. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Um, <laughs> there is a national assault on the subject of authority, um, and we need to look at the subject of authority freshly, freshly. And a part of the problem is that we think that authority and power are the same things. There are many people that have powerful abilities, powerful callings, or even some degree of spiritual power that don't understand the laws of authority. And so what happens is when you expect from power what only flows by authority you have to access an illegitimate power. So all of the human institutions flow by authority. I hope you're taking notes because this is not intro anymore. Every human institution on earth flows by authority. Now just to help you understand it, let's walk through the human institutions. Marriage, an authority issue. Family, an authority issue. Even the sun and the moon were given authority by God. The Bible says that he has set up the sun and the moon to tell times, seasons, festivals, and moments of day. So there is even authority over, the sun has authority to determine what's day. The moon has authority to determine what's night. There is authority in the animal kingdom. All, all every kingdom, every institution on earth is governed by authority. It is not governed by power. It's governed by by authority. There's a message that I preach called who in hell are you? And a part of what it means is that there is a way to use power to usurp divine authority. When Paul walked up to the sons of Sceva, the Bible says that these boys tried to use what they learned from Paul against a demonic spirit, but there was only one problem. They had no authority. Paul spoke to the spirit 
and, and the spirit said, Paul, or the sons of Sceva tried to address the demon. And the Bible says the sons of Sceva, Sceva said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who were you? The principle is to be known in hell, you must be an authority figure. You don't have the same, unless you're hellish, you need to be known in hell for the right reasons. To be known in hell the right way is to be subject to and in the flow of authority. And the people of God said amen. So one of the problems with where America is going is that we're calling on things by power that can only happen by authority. Sickness and infirmity is not an issue of power. It is an issue over author of authority. When Jesus gave the 12 uh, uh, power, the Bible says that he gave them power and authority to cast out unclean devils. Ask me why. Because you do not cast out demons by power. You cast out devils by authority. That's how they got Jesus' reputation wrong. The Bible says that they accused him of casting out devils by Beelzebub, which was another power. It was not an authority. So deliverance then is the combating and the conflicting of one authority over another authority. Does that make sense to you? It is the invasion of one kingdom against another kingdom. Now already, this is already messing with you because a part of how we treat, especially the powers of hell, is that it is a chaotic environment. We act as if the forces of darkness are illogical, that they have no systems, they have no procedures, they have no processes, and those are myths. The powers of hell are highly organized. Not only are they highly organized, they are extreme legalists. Every generational curse, or what the Bible calls a familiar spirit, which are spirits that are assigned to families, do not just arrive like the chicken pox. They have to have legal points of access. Don't get bored yet, because this is going to bless you in a minute. A familiar spirit, or a spirit assigned to a family unit, does not return normally until they've achieved their intent for a family. But they do so by legal what? authority. Does this make sense to you? So all of the created order functions in the laws of authority. Now in the church we have suffered a major crisis when we started finding out that the Roman Catholic government was molesting and moving in pedophilia. We have had so many scandals over the last several years, uh, probably 20 to 30 years of, of indiscretions and, and drug addictions and all of that amongst pastors that the subject of authority no longer has the type of credibility that it did. In fact leaders are running so far from being seen as oppressive that they almost never teach on authority because to teach on authority people hear propaganda agenda you want to tell me what to do and the, the problem with that is when you come out of one kingdom whether you know it or not you were not just a sinner you were a slave to another god and when you got saved you shifted your god and you made jesus christ the lord of your life right it is unfortunate that you come into this kingdom without learning its protocols without learning its authority issues and without dealing with your fear of submission. Now, the reason that's going to be key if you're taking notes, you want to put an asterisk there because you'll never have a victory beyond submission. Every victory in your life will begin and end with submission. Therefore, when the enemy gets you afraid to submit, what he's really done is made victory impossible. Submission is your key to a strength greater than yours. Submission is your key to a wisdom greater than yours. If you only if you only find trustworthiness in doing what you want to do, which is a cursed behavior in the book of Judges, and you only restrict yourself to your own logic, your own reasoning, your own way to live, what you've really done is bankrupted yourself from another set of resources, and you have to live life in your own strength and with your own knowledge. Why? God sees submission as the green light to more of everything. If you need more money, he's going to start with how submitted you are. If you need more access or more influence, it all flows through submission. So now we see that poverty ain't about money until it's already fully in you. Poverty is broken by the power of 
information. Even when you have a spirit of poverty, you have submitted your life to something called mammon. It is all a submission issue. But if we conversely employ that principle, then it means that when we do submit, we have an inroad for something bigger than us. And the people of the Lord said, Amen. Now we see how this operates. And so I, I, I want to start this series with teaching on something that I probably have not thoroughly taught on in the last 10 years or so because it's really at the fundament of who we are as people. I've got to talk to you about the power of witchcraft. And I'm going to teach you what the Bible says about witchcraft because if you're not in it, you're probably under it. And I'm going to tell you why. Now, immediately before you shut this out, when you think witch, you think a long green nose, a mole on the side of the face, or a broom somewhere. And then some of you are friends with witches. You talk to them daily. Listen, but you don't think they're a witch because they don't think they're a witch. You can be a witch and not know it. Say, take it deeper. You can be a thoughtful witch, a kind witch. As a matter of fact, most effective witches have to be thoughtful so that they retain their influence to your life and decisions. If they're mean, most people don't want to be around mean people. So they're going to be the first to send you offerings. I said that. They're going to be the first to take you to dinner. They're going to be the first to offer you a vacation. Why? It gives them access to sensitive areas to your life. There is a such thing as Christian witchcraft. I'm going to take you through everything the Bible says about witchcraft. You're like, well, why is he talking about that? Because that is the Bible definition for the usurping of authority. If you are against authority, you are in fact in witchcraft. And I have Bible for all of it. If you are against, this is why when people send us emails or ask for counsel, my pastor won't do this, my pastor won't do that. If for whatever reason you are in a local house, or in a fellowship or whatever, and you are in vehement disagreement with who is in authority, it's always best for both parties that either you subject yourself or leave. Because if you stay, listen, and become the confidant, the counselor, or the advisor of other disgruntled people, then what's going to happen is you have now made yourself an influence against authority. Consider the lesson of David. David was anointed years before he was in position. I think eight or nine or something like that. He was anointed. He had the ability to be king, but he was not in position. And because David knew what witchcraft was, I'll prove it to you, he did not lift a hand against Saul because he considered himself more competent. In charismatic churches where people all have gifts and all have a voice and power to the people and I'm here for the struggle, I'm going against the system. And what you do is you usurp your personal ability or gifts against a position you have now qualified to be the local witch. In the laws of authority, when you defy authority, you are in fact open to the spirit of witchcraft. Now, before I give you my first scripture, I want you to consider this. On the earth, the word of God is the final authority. Can we say that together? On the earth, the word of God is the final authority. So if you don't have the word of God as the highest authority in your life, you are already very susceptible to deception, very susceptible uh, to being naive when it comes to your interactions with people, your interactions with church, because if you don't know the word of God, you don't know what you have a right to. You don't know how to correct your behavior. You have no text or no manuscript to manicure your posture before people who carry the power to promote you. Now, I'll get there Sunday, but all of your promotion is going to come through a vessel. It's going to come from the Lord, but through a man. So if you have people issues, you'll always be poor. And if you don't believe me, go to work tomorrow and give yourself a raise. Even if it was God's idea, he's going to do it through a man. Mm. So the word of God is the highest authority. It is important to know the word of God. It governs all of the Christian life. It's a dangerous thing for a believer to have a casual relationship with their Bible. Number two, you have spiritual authorities. Now, the Bible says,
says there is no authority except for all that that is allowed and permitted by God. And there are times when God allows for an authority to come into being, even though he don't think it's the right guy. He will give people a king based upon their desires. So the kings of a people often reflect the desire and the heart of that people. Whether you want to hear this or not, and this is not political propaganda, because I say all and over and over again, I'm not Democrat or Republican, I'm kingdom. Our, our current president reflects the soul of our nation, which is why the only people that are really appalled at what he does is black people. Say la. So uh, spiritual authorities, spiritual authorities. What did Israel cry? Give us a king. Give us a king. We got what we wanted. Number two, you have civil authorities, your bosses, your, your job, your uh, 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 managers, those that are over you academically, um, you know, those are authorities. Number three, you have familial authorities, familial, not fam uh, familiar, but familial. Those are moms and dads. Those are authority figures, okay? So again, those are, those are the categories. The word of God is the highest authority, which means that you don't violate the highest authority to appease the, sec the secondary authorities. A husband, a wife, a mom, a dad, a police officer should never be powerful enough to influence you away from right and wrong by the word of God. So the word of God is the highest authority. You have spiritual authorities, watchmen that the Holy Ghost appoints over your soul. Then you have civil authorities, that are those that operate with your human and your civilian life. And then you have family authority. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and I'm going to uh, give you uh, verse 20 through 23. Now, the prophet Samuel, prior to the monarchy in Israel, was the highest civil and spiritual authority in Israel. Please write this down. Before there was the monarchy in Israel, which is basically the system of kings, the highest authority was what? The prophets and then the judge. The judge. The judge. Samuel was the last judge. So they were equivalent to the head of the state of Israel. So Samuel was an authority. He developed both of their first kings. He gave Saul an instruction to kill a certain amount of animals and to make sure that they were all done for war purposes. For context, to understand this segment of scripture, you have to understand what Saul did. Saul went and killed most of the people and the animals. The prophet Samuel received word from the Lord that Saul did not obey. He said, I hear in the distance the cry of these animals. What Saul did, please pay attention because many of you are guilty of this. He approached the directive as best he could, but he did not obey completely. Partial obedience is disobedience. You don't get credit for almost obeying. Saul decided that he was going to save the, the people or the animals he didn't kill to make an offering to God. He was like, man, it's been a rough year. I'm going to uh, 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 save and spare these. I'm not going to follow the instruction, but I'm going to spare these to make an offering to God. He was actually, uh, some people would have said he had good motive for it. He saved it to me. And when he got to Samuel, Samuel said, God does not want your sacrifice because you've sacrificed disobedience. It's like how many of you give God something he's not asking for. You want to preach, sing, dance around this issue that he really wants. If God has given you an issue to obey him on, you can't disobey him on that and then try to get extra credit work by helping other people or publishing a book or going and doing a Facebook Live or any of that because that's not what he wants. He would rather have a broken and a contrite heart than a brand new record. He don't need no more EPs out. What he wants is your sanctification. Look at 1 Samuel 15, 20. Saul said unto Samuel, yeah, I obeyed the voice of the Lord. This is verse 20. And have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of the Amaleks, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But look at what 21 says. But the people took up the spoil, sheep and oxen. So now he's lying because wherever there is disobedience, deliberate disobedience, you have to be dishonest either to yourself or to somebody else. He says, the people took the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things that should have been utterly destroyed, and they wanted to sacrifice it. Samuel said, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices better than obeying his voice? That's where we get the phrase, obedience is better than sacrifice. It's not saying that God wants you to obey and not be sacrificial. It's saying, do what God asked you to do, okay? And instead of trying
trying to appease him by doing what he didn't. Look at verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Why? In this particular text, what is the highest authority? The word of God. The leader that God sent to him. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Let's look at number two. And stubbornness is as, y'all coughing already, boy. <laughs> and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. I'm about to make you very uncomfortable in five seconds. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So we have several things to work through. Take notes. First of all, you're going to always find this quadrant, this, this group. Wherever there is rebellion, you can be certain there will be witchcraft. Where there is witchcraft, you're going to find that there's probably stubbornness. Stubbornness is idolatry. And wherever you have all of that, you're going to have a cloak of rejection. Let's look at it again. You see rebellion. Don't you see that in the verse? Don't take my word for it. You see witchcraft. You see stubbornness. You see idolatry. And you see rejection. Five themes of this verse. Now let me tell you how hypocritical most church people are. If RuPaul came in here right now, all uh, six feet, eight of him, came in here right now and sat next to you, most of you around him would be crit critical, judgmental, fault finding, oh my God, is them nails? Oh my God, what is this? Oh, it's too much. They doing too much. But in God's eyes, if you are stubborn, you are an idolater. It's just not as obvious as you bringing an elephant to worship, but you're going to get the same punishment when you get to hell. Think about it. In God's mind, people who bow to the calf in the Old Testament are just as evil as those of you who are stubborn. You see, in the church, we don't treat the word of God plainly, so we really think that God has harsher judgments for more visible evils. No, if you're stubborn, you are still going to find your way on the path to hell. Here's why. Stubborn people may not worship a goat or a calf. They just worship their opinion. They worship their view. They worship their preference. I know you're uncomfortable. Y'all just are itching and bleeping and blah. I get it. Stubbornness is idolatry, and rebellion is witchcraft. Now, apostolic prophetic churches, highly spiritual churches, are especially sensitive to this spirit and susceptible to it because of their desire for the power. But the supernatural power comes from two sources. You can get supernatural power from heaven or supernatural power from hell. Supernatural power or influence can come from heaven, and supernatural power or influence can come from hell. So in essence, witchcraft is the use of power not under authority. Witchcraft can also be soulish power from a spiritual being. <laughs> Y'all are so underwhelmed. But anything that defies authority is going to be is going to have to be rebellious and it's going to be moving in witchcraft. You can be very certain, and here's why. If you are not an, a legitimate authority, you can't exist on earth without being attached to some authority. So the opposite of legitimate authority is what? Illegitimate authority. And illegitimate authority is packed or is protected by illegitimate power. The name of that illegitimate power is what? Witchcraft. Now, we're dealing with being undercover because Psalms 91 and all scripture that talks about authority, the real vision, I want you to hear this, the real vision is protection. The problem with most people is they don't know how to be protected. So they fight the subject of authority. They fight the act of authority. They fight authority scenarios because they have no context for what being protected feels like. Does that make sense? And when they're in a situation where they are vulnerable and need to be protected, they find more comfortable that I, may, I can be my own protector. And so they end up having to rebel against the appointed authorities over and around that life. So it's very important that you understand. 
Conversely, the occult is the same way. And I'm going to give you two more statements of scripture, but I'm going to teach this as much as true. If you deal with somebody who has gone off into the occult, and you only deal with the occult, you've not dealt with the root of the issue. The root of the occult is rebellion. What drives occultic power is rebellion. Why? Witchcraft and the occult, the whole idea is to overexert their will and ideas on you, either obviously or not obviously. Believe it or not, and many of you are going to laugh at this, but I don't care. I have seen witchcraft operate through the gifts. I have seen where one or two people in smaller Pentecostal segments had a strong opinion about what the pastor should do or not and how he should treat an issue or not. And they didn't have the guts to man up about it because manipulation is never direct. They have to find a back way to get their point across. So I've watched it. Oh, I'm coming. If I haven't offended you yet, I'm going to offend you in a minute. So what they'll do is one of the people in the gossip group will get a tongue. The other person in the gossip group will interpret it. And it'll be their public way of telling the leader how to run what he should do. What is it? Manipulation. You know who else can be master manipulators? Babies. Some of you are growing witches. Let me teach you how. If a child knows that you're distracted on the phone, hosting for tea, and they know normally when you're focused, you're not going to give them a cookie. They never ask you for a cookie when they know you're coherent and know what they're doing. But they know if mommy's hosting, if daddy's hosting, let me go and ask for a cookie. They're coercing a way to get their way. And before you've known it, you have abdicated your role as the authority because you want to move on with what you do. That stuff starts at two and three. Write this down. The objective of witchcraft is to intimidate, manipulate, and dominate. To intimidate, manipulate, and dominate. It is all at the end of the day about taking a person's will and strength away and exerting your ideas and exerting your will. The witch's creed, a part of what you don't know, we've, we've been in deliverance and spiritual warfare all the life of this church. Saturday night, last Saturday, what y'all don't know, if you don't study deliverance and spiritual warfare, is the largest satanic gathering in America. The Saturday of Resurrection Weekend is always the National Witches Gathering. And a part of their creed, you know, like we have creeds, denominations have creeds. A part of their creed is do what you will, just don't hurt them. So it's all about exerting your will for a, a better way or what you feel like is superior intellect or superior knowledge. You're going to always find that it's very, it's almost impossible to be a dumb rebel. Most people who are rebellious are very knowledgeable. And when they appear in your church, they're going to look like good resources. They're going to look like confidants. They're going to be like the representations of the pastors. They're going to be the intimidary between leadership and people. They're going to say something like, people just come to me with their complaints. And people always come to me right when they want to leave. And what they're looking for is the right to be influential and powerful even if they don't have a position. Because if I have the influence, I don't need the position. If I can control who should or should not be leading worship by the fact that they confided in me and I have their information, then I can spread that or use that to disqualify them from the back row. Now, in my experience, most of the witches that have come here have been expertise in witches. They come in the door identifying everybody else as a witch. And when I put my hand on them, then all of a sudden there were breakdowns, sabotages, threats, all kinds of stuff. Why? They're going to go out of their way to camouflage through language. If I say I see witches, you're not going to think I'm one. But it's all about, listen, strategically posting yourself by people who either have the ear, and I'm going to tell you what a lot of witches want is favor. If a witch identifies that you have favor in a thing, or favor and momentum, if they can't get it, they're going to post themselves by you disingenuously to try to borrow your own favor. And you will only see it manifest when you 
restrict their access to it. Then the true colors will form. My God. I have seen witchcraft in marriage. There can be witchcraft in holy matrimony. I have two more segments of scripture, but I'm going to show you this because many of you, your mom is a witch. Your daddy can move in witchcraft, and here's how. It is native to the feminine species to use manipulation as their witchcraft form. For men, they typically use intimidation. So if you spend all of your life because your father has a hot button and he goes off and he punches walls and you're fighting for his acceptance, living your life in eggshells, making all of your decisions to not make him explode, you have succumbed to that thing in his soul that's even from his, 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 little, his little chair. He could be at home drinking a beer watching uh, the NFL and you somewhere and can't make an individual decision because you don't want his rage. It's the spirit of witchcraft. Think about how powerful that is for you to be making a decision around his emotional stability, sometimes in another city, sometimes in another home, but even from that chair with a remote, he's controlling your life and choices. It's a spirit of intimidation. Women do it by manipulation. Here is the common scenario. If a man, for whatever reason, has proven not to be trustworthy, those of you that leave family life need to know this. If a man has either cheated on his wife, lost the job and can't provide, or is a, a, a bum and don't want to get a real job, and, or whatever the case is, and he has to, as a condition of their reconciliation, prove to his wife that he can support her, then what happens is if she has a fit of rage, sees something a certain way, is uncomfortable, sometimes that man will abase his own judgment to appease the wife just to make her feel secure, even if it's in recklessness. So what's happened is, even from the place of being the weaker vessel, she has now man emotionally manipulated him to do what she wanted so that he could prove to her that he was on her side. Even if it was in direct disrespect to the will and purpose of God, if there is a Jezebel, there is an Ahab. Now, sometimes the genders are reversed because I have seen male Jezebels and, and, and female Ahabs where the wife has no identity whatsoever. She is just a counterpart and an addition to the elaborate story of a strong, aggressive, domineering man. That woman is now an Ahab. Mothers can be manipulative, use witchcraft. Um, and make you, first of all, let me clarify why this is demonic. Acceptance is not something you fight for. I need a whole month to teach you this stuff. But you do not fight for acceptance. If you've got to convince, prove to mothers and fathers that you deserve to be loved and supported, you have changed the nature of the relationship already to servant master. Slave, slave owner. If I am born to you, I should not have to be good enough to be wanted. So those of you that work overtime, I know I'm in here, to get good grace, to keep a job, to prove that you can have a man, to prove that you're doing something, so you can finally get the acceptance of the people you were born to, you have already relinquished your right to your own life. Sometimes a mom will cry. Sometimes they'll give you wisdom. Many times they will compare you to another more achieved sibling. It is all manipulative forms of witchcraft. Now, you may be like, well, they mean well. That's fine. Most witches mean well. There's only a few witches that want to kill you. It's not about meaning well. It's about control. They want the right to control. Do this or else. Do this or else. I think I want get away, blah, 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 blah. It abdicates your right to choose. Does this make sense to you? So I've seen that if a husband, by God's order, when a woman and a man have a disagreement, they go together to God prayerfully to consider the wisdom of God for that family. It should never be that a woman nags and nags and nags and cries and cries and cries and make the man feel like his decision to obey God is leaving her exposed because she don't like something. It's a form of witchcraft.
church, when wives have witchcraft, they befriend each other. Because they don't want sober women to check them on their witchcraft. Listen, if the basis of your friendship is who and what you don't like, it kills me how people can't stand each other when they're members and become united when they leave. That's how you know it's a spirit of witchcraft. That I don't care if y'all friends with them. I'm saying when I, if they didn't talk, I couldn't pay them to sit next to each other, couldn't pay them to work on a project, and then all of a sudden, let's connect, bro. Let's connect, sis. God is joining us. No, 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 no. Y'all couldn't connect under authority. Now why do you think you can connect when you're outside of authority? It's because you're a bunch of witches. Trick or Treat Conference 2018. You don't make friends on who you don't like. And here's why. Here's why. Here's why. Gossip is a powerful form of witchcraft because what it does is it works to paint an image of a person that may or may not be true. If I break this down on this level, my experience with you may not be who and how you really are. That may just be my experience with you. I, maybe I just don't like you. But to take that interaction and publicize that, stigmatize that, and spread that is a control issue. Because now what you're working to do is shape how people see me. Because your real problem ain't me, watch me, is how people see me. And you hate the fact that they love the one you don't like. It's witchcraft. So when a conversation starts off with, did you hear? Have you heard? It got back to me. Or I got proof. Or I was in a meeting. Or I heard. All of those are different weapons in the arsenal of a witch or a warlock. Because it's all about the will. It's all about power, control, knowledge. If you are friends with people who only want to know what's going on in all nations, I'm telling you, you need to warn. You, you, that is your sign that somebody, listen, I'm being very serious. If they don't go here, but they want to get next to you to find out, well, what's going on? I heard this. I said, who works in the office? Who goes in the town? Who got ordained? What are they doing like that? What's the next thing? Oh, I heard about that. Oh, that's a new campus. Da, 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 da. What are they looking for? access points to sensitive information that will later become the point of a bribe. They are all witches. Go to Galatians 5. Now some of you in here and can't say amen because you're convicted. We're going to do deliverance because you can move in witchcraft unaware. Galatians 5. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. I'm talking about the power of witchcraft. The power of witchcraft. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. Are you there? Are you there? I'm going to tell you another very common way this spirit comes through people and on people through group sexual experiences. In the Old Testament, orgies were a manifestation of a witchcraft spirit. Go to your local midnight musical. Find out where they're hanging out after the service. I'm not, I'm not being mean. I'm being very honest. Now, a lot of you, because you didn't come up in church when I talk about stuff like this, you're like, my God, I can't believe they do that. But it's a very real thing. They'll get together. And you know the Bible word for sorcery, Pastor Mike, which is why our musicians are so tormented, many of them are in the stream of sorcery. The devil has made them feel like they are their most creative. They sing their best when they're on some type of hallucinant. So they've got to drink, they got to smoke, and bring themselves to an out-of-body experience. Even their most reckless sexual decisions are done when they are on some external chemical agent. That stuff is not new. It's very ancient. The Old Testament uh, 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 people that were in the temples have been doing that stuff to conjure fertility rites. Behind that spirit is always a drive of productivity. You sleep with, with people to get on music labels. You sleep with people to get deals and recommendations. It's all fighting for productivity, fertility gods. It's demonic. It's been there since the Old Testament. It was never God's intention for you to be a part of a sex party in a room with 20 people, and you don't even know this brother's name. You're like, oh, bump, bump, bump. There you go. Hey, what's your name? All right, when you see me, act like we don't know each other. And then you 
brother's gonna go to the next musical and then the next musical and same background here and same soprano over there and y'all all know y'all know what each other's birthmark is it's witchcraft it's a real thing Galatians 5 19 now here's a part of what you did not know about witchcraft and I'm not turning my plow Galatians 5 19 now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication uncleanness uncleanliness lasciviousness the next verse this is verse 20 says idolatry what's next witchcraft now let's look at some of the character statements that Paul categorizes with the spirit of witchcraft hatred variance emulations wrath or anger problems I'll cuss you out I'll cuss you out I have an anger problem strife seditions and heresies so if we're looking at this contextually if you see heresy or false teaching a lot of these spiritist churches in Chicago have a rich heritage in spiritism they call themselves spiritual churches but it's really spiritism they reverence the dead they burn candles and call it good luck um, um, it's really you can sense that spirit it's been here and many of them well, yeah, amen praise the Lord so uh, <laughs> strife seditions wrath hatred variance you're going to find that stuff always around witchcraft notice in many smaller especially highly Pentecostal segments you're going to find a lot more of that control wear this wear that we are the way come against uh, uh, separate from your family because they ain't saved they weren't baptized in Jesus name or don't go to that church or don't arch your eyebrows or wear your hair like this if they, what they've made it seem like is that pleasing God is about rules and do's and don'ts now let's make no mistake about it holiness is holiness sin is sin deliverance is deliverance my most popular YouTube video is 40 signs of witchcraft churches and occult organizations that one video and, and the way it works with me is very few people are indifferent either you love me or you hate me very few people are like uh, everybody's got an opinion they're gonna stand somewhere on the issue and it's a part of bringing attention to the agenda of witchcraft let me give you this if you don't want to be persecuted stay away from the ministry of deliverance the devil is going to make sure that if you are in the ministry of deliverance he's going to try to intimidate you out of it all the time and he does not use unbelievers to do it the ministry of deliverance and spiritual warfare is a highly persecuted ministry Jesus' first accusation came after he started dealing with demons <laughs> praise his high name so it is a work of the flesh. Let's go to 2 Kings 9, 22. I'm almost done, but I've got to teach this to you. Because some of you are suffering from witchcraft. Many of you are using witchcraft. Now we have to deal with this because it's a rising issue in the earth. The assault on authority. The assault on authority. It's a powerful spirit of witchcraft. Look at 2 Kings 9, 22. And it came to pass. Are you there? And it came to pass. When Joram saw Jehu, that he said, is it peace, Jehu? Now, this is after Je Jehu went after Jezebel. And he answered, what peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother, who? And her witchcraft are so many. Wherever you find the spirit of Jezebel, there will be witchcraft. Jezebel is a witchcraft spirit. One of the ways, now, and every Jezebel is not loud and domineering. Many of them are. But some Jezebels are just seductive. And it can be in men. There is a seductive spirit in a lot of men that want to lure you in. And you can really see it in the eyes. There are certain people who try to lure you in by stares and glares and glances. And you look at them so long, you be in the sunken place. Right in the middle of trying to worship. You just go right on in. I get so weak in the knee. No, ma'am. You're under witchcraft, lady. That's what's happening. Ain't no love supposed to make you weak in your knees. It's supposed to make you stand. Get on up on this thing. Jezebel and witchcraft are tied. A domineering, demeaning spirit. It's a witchcraft spirit. I'm going to tell you a very uncommon man of, or a very uh, unsuspecting Jezebel manifestation is tears. There are people who know that arguing with you won't work, fighting with you won't work, so they'll just cry. Why? It's a way to gain control. By the time I've cried, you're going to stop digging and stop trying to figure out what's wrong. Because I've been through so much. 
and I, I can't go through this anymore. I went without food for seven days, and then I came to the office and stapled a paper, and you didn't give me a position. Anybody that bypasses the pro- 
protocols of a place is moving against the divine authority on that house. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us. Now, in the Greek, that word is pythos. Pythos. It literally means python. In a spirit called python. Which brought her masters much gain. Now listen, many agendas and spirits that move in the spirit of divination are going to have access to some resource. It's how they get unrecognized. So they're going to be managers. They can give you a good word with their boss. They're going to be people. And this is why I counsel all of the pastors I oversee. I don't care how desperate you are for help. If these ninjas ain't been with you longer than a year, don't you promote them. You let everybody, you even everything out. And what happens is if a pastor gets to a point of desperation where they need a music director or they need an armor bearer or they need a youth pastor and somebody comes in the door saying, I think the Lord sent me. And what you do is you hear that as God's answer to prayer and you don't take the time to validate, to examine, to see what character is there because you're desperate for the resource. You have positioned this person in a way where they can destroy your whole thing. Since you start saying to them, they're like, I've been looking, waiting on you. These They ain't doing nothing around here. They lazy. I hate them. That you, Pastor, can't sing. I'm so glad you're a better soloist than them. And you start feeding this potential person with derogatory information about people that's been here. Now, when you're not looking, what this person is going to do is be embellished and inflamed because they got the heart and the ear of the leader, and they know the leader's frustrations about the people they're leading. That's a witch you made. That's a warlock you built. This is why the greatest warfare in any house is in the, the inner circle of that leader. There are people that can be powerful just by being the leader's confidants. They ain't got to ever do nothing. If they feel or see a certain way and convince or persuade that leader against the people, it's very hard to turn that way. But you don't ever give that type of sensitivity to somebody who comes in with a cape and acts like they're going to bypass every protocol because of who they are and what they have. And if they are offended that you suggest that they should be processed, it's the devil's way of saying, hey, I'm the devil. Don't see me. Hey, 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 ask me why. The devil hates process. Did you hear what I said? The devil hates a process. You, don't, you can't tell the devil, wait. You try to tell a person with a, a demon of ambition, you need to go through some more classes. How many more classes I got to go through? Them demons don't even like you to redirect them to delegated authority. Depending upon their agenda, if they come to you, they want you. And some of them spirits will say, I came here for the senior leader. I understand that. I understand it. That, and when you and, and listen, you if you come to me with that, you don't know me well at all. Because that's an automatic way for me to decide I will never listen to you again. You just told me what was in you. See, I need somebody of greater power. I can't handle an elder BJ. I don't want to handle Dr. Ross. I need what's on. I've already had visions. I've already had dreams. In my mind, I'm like, which, 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 which? Influence is gained by process. You don't give influence to an unprocessed anything. And I don't care how anointed you are, if you were sent by the Spirit of God, you ain't going to have a problem with foundations. You're not going to have a problem with new images. You're not going to have a problem with prophetic training. You are not going to have a problem with the systems that are in place before you. But when you want to be seen, you will have a problem with process. Verse 17. Now look. The same followed Paul. The same followed Paul. Now some of you leaders and influential people and elders in here, don't be naive. Thinking that because you're apostolic and prophetic and bold and got discernment, that people with witchcraft won't try to attach themselves to you. Don't think that I'll spot them a mile away. Okay. Some of them demons will show.
show up and try to buy you. They'll try to bless you. They'll try to pour your water. You've got to know the motive of people. And you've got to... <laughs> they followed Paul, and you would think this demon would be scared. But she followed Paul. I'm with the movement. Try. I found my try. I'm with my people. Hey, family, follow Paul. Listen, what did she say? These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. The problem is what she said was true. What she said made sense. It was not an obvious ploy. Many of us would say this chick had a prophetic gift. Verse 18, and this she did many days. But Paul being what? God has given every real leader a grief system. If you are uncertain about a person, a project, a thing, you got to pay attention to how you feel in your spirit about it. There have been times where a move I wanted to make made so much sense up here, but I just could not find a peace about it. And I'm the type of person where if I can't find peace, I'll take as long as I need to to wait for it or I won't act on it at all. Peace is a sign of the direction of the Lord. Something should not be keeping you up at night, disturbing your rest, stressing you out. If that is there, that's God's way of trying to talk to you in a way you'll hear. Because some of you will see somebody's potential and make a judgment on what they could be. But what they are is still in witchcraft. And if you put them in there before they're transformed and before they're healed and before they're whole, you're going to run the risk of hurting way more people to try to appease this person with a position. See, even somebody's wisdom can be witchcraft if they don't live to it. That's why I hate Facebook. A lot of you coons, uh, I almost call y'all coons, a lot of you people got so much advice that you don't live up to you want to talk about the church how to build a better brand how to come home to your husband and you don't apply nothing you living up to what is it control it's not just advice you want to you want to imply superior intelligence even your wisdom could be a manifestation of witchcraft if you're not being measured by it It's a spirit of witchcraft, a desire for power, for influence and control. This she did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned to her and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So we don't know if it was a couple minutes. We don't know if they had to roll around with that thing. Some of the people, as I have had experience pulled with this spirit, some of the people that dealt with witchcraft the most were the people who you just would not imagine. I mean, I'd be preaching and musicians would start writhing on the floor like snakes or sometimes the pastor's children or anything like that. And it's important. These people start to manifest those spirits because of what they've lived under, the domination, the control. And this is why even if people use witchcraft against you, you need some ministry to make sure you don't give that out. It is, it is because you give what you've been given. If you've been dominated and controlled and your rights have been taken away from you and you've been demasculated and people have robbed your individuality, it's a chance that sometimes under pressure you're going to snap into total recall and do what was done to you. That's why deliverance is important. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because it can set free the victim and the victimizer. It, 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 can, it can loose everybody. Amen. Praise. So this is why it's a strategy against the church. Look what happened. Verse 19 says, and when her masters saw that the hope of their gains, because there were people making money off of her witchcraft. It was a scheme. Selling stuff. They caught who? Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace with their rulers into a riot and ultimately tried to lock them up. The whole agenda of this thing was to incarcerate the apostles to make sure that they did not have free range to build, to advance, to move. It's a spirit called Python. You've got to be careful who wants to wrap themselves around you when you hurt or when you're vulnerable or when you're afraid or when you are offended. Those are the wrong times to start new relationships. Oh, I'm talking in this Anglican church. 
somebody find out you offended and all of a sudden if you need somebody to talk to I got a new ministry called healing the sheep in my basement conference I want you to come and I'm going to sell you some deliverance I want you I'm going to have a sale I'm going to cast out two rejections for $5.99 come and hear me and what's going to happen is because you got pride and rebellion operating in you you're not asking what authority is overseeing this and here's a problem most of you can't get with this in a church context but if the person next to you tried to arrest you right now and there's something called a citizen's arrest and take you to jail you'd swing off of them why they ain't got no authority see authority is about how you were trained how somebody else stood over you to validate and to guarantee your service it's called licensed bonded and insured Witchcraft is the use of power without authority. The only difference in most cases, the only difference between a murderer and a cop is their badge. The weapon is the same, but the training is different. The accountability is different. The flow of authority is different. This is why it's so hard to penalize crooked cops. It's easier to deal with people who are not authority figures. But there are procedures that protect those that have authority. Does that make sense to you? Now, if we're looking at it, if we're looking at it in the realm of the spirit, you may have a gun. All right. My gun is 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 my marketplace anointing or my marriage ministry. This is my gun. I'm gonna go, come on, J Lynn, make me a graphic. Let me find somebody, make me a graphic. I'm going to just come out here. I'm, yeah, come on. I got to, it's time to do me. That's my gun. But I don't have a badge. So let's say something I teach causes somebody to stumble. Let's, let's say I shoot the wrong bullet. Without a badge, nothing can be done to remediate, to rectify, or correct my crime. Now let's say I use the same gun but I am an authority, a traceable, trackable, verifiable authority. I have accountability. If I teach you something stupid, if I am in error, if I lead you wrong, if I counsel you against your spiritual leader or against your husband or against your wife, there is a complaint that can be filed that can expose you as a crooked cop. Does that make sense to you? Many of us have guns. Most of your teenagers know where they could go in the city and get a gun. They do. That's why we got so many of them, right? But it takes time to get educated, processed, background checks, to trust your use of the weapon. It's rebellion. And this has got to be one of the most rebellious generations in the history of America. Now, here's the danger of it. The danger of it is that when people manifest rebellion, whatever the reason is, hurt, miscommunication, whatever, when they manifest rebellion, I give you two to three years max before you be in full-blown occult. Because that's going to be the byproduct of that. You're going to eventually open yourself up to spirituality without making Jesus Christ the Lord of that thing. Because here's the deal. You're not going to be able to continue to come to prayer, submit to the word of God, and not have that issue of rebellion. Let me tell you what most of them do. If most of them get confronted on their rebellion, they go to Old Testament Israel. If you tell them you are foul, you're out of order, your mouth is out of order, they're going to say, God called me like the Old Testament prophet in the cave. We the people. Stand up for our rights. We're coming against the system. And they're going to go to a pre-Jesus world to justify their New Testament lack of accountability. You're going to use the standards of men who didn't even have homes who roam throughout the streets relying on widows to feed them for why you don't have to be accountable to a five-fold structure that can prove who you is and ain't. Rebellion. And, and many of them think they're prophetic. And, and some of them will go to a non-prophetic church to make sure that the leader can't correct them. It's about control. So there'll be a prophetic person, whisper a little dream here, a little dream there, a little warning there, squint, give a, a little consultant uh, uh, words to people. And then let's 
house is in operation it's the same with people who hurl insults in arguments it is the same if we can healthily and intelligently argue without you immediately going to profanity and vow language what's happened you have shown your emotional stagnation. You're not mentally developed enough to have a conversation around the subject of difference, so you want to hit while it hurts. What is it? Control. I'm trying to shut you down and bring this point so I can win. I just want to win. It's all about control. I don't want to hear the conversation, or I don't even want to come to a resolve. I don't want to be reconciled. I want my point heard. It's a spirit of witchcraft. Because it's control. So the first thing, when we're dealing with undercover, I'm done, and what, why authority is in the earth, it's for protection. And listen, for the types of stuff I'm called to, one thing I don't want is to not be protected. I don't understand people. I want protection. I've got some dangerous stuff, amen, that I'm called up against and I'm called to. So the way to receive the protective ministry of God is to make sure that you are under authority. Because even if something is aimed at me, if I got the right covering, that thing will miss me and hit the head. And if the head is right, it's supposed to be able to handle what was trying to hurt me. Which is why, okay. <laughs> this is why if you in your heart of hearts feel like you're more anointed than your pastor, that's not your pastor. It's a pastor. But it's not yours. If you don't trust and if you have no confidence in your leader's spiritual ability to teach you wickedness, to protect you from danger, to warn you, or even to give you hard words, if you sit under that teaching every week, oh, here we go with this stupidity again. What you've said is your season is above the word, the spiritual anointing, and the rank of your leader, which is why you're not going to grow. You're in whole defiance. I want you to come to my church. Because my pastor, you know, he count, he not in the gifts. But we want the wind to come. We be like, oh, okay, can we get some oil? Immediately I'm like, listen, it doesn't matter what I come and preach. God charged that head with the responsibility of creating culture. And your desperation or your fear of leaving to become a nobody. not going to put me in the position to go in and dishonor that man in his house. That's the problem. Some people don't want to bring, some people need to leave, but their approach is I want to be changed. I want to be the change. And what they're afraid of losing is influence. They're known. They got relationships. They're the pastor's armor bearer or the wife's handmaiden, and they don't want to go somewhere and start over because they put too much time in at another place. But you're not going to turn the Titanic in 20 days, fam. That, ch that church is 200 years old. One revival is not going to change the whole culture. And folk going to fall, spit up, roll on the floor and everything, and going to get back up and do what they were programmed to do by the head. All the majority of the change every church needs to make has to happen in the heart of that leader. If the heart of that leader does not change, y'all can forget it. So the point is, is don't you be in witchcraft, sitting in the back shooting darts in the spirit, I guess. Try to make him preach or teach something else because you don't like it. No, leave. Out of integrity, find somebody that you can obey. But if you can't obey the last 10 people you were under, you're the problem. It's rebellion. And, I, and listen, this black man, I'm not afraid to talk about rebellion. It's a real issue. And where there is rebellion, there's going to be death. There will be death. Something has to die. In the, there was an Old Testament law, if you ever find a rebel, kill him. Why? Because when a person is a rebellious person by
church to church, from relationship to relationship, because that molestation imparted a vagabond spirit in you. But to be anywhere too long scares you. You are afraid of stability, and at the root of it is a spirit of rebellion. Let's pray. <laughs> the saints are like, now let me say this. I'm going to dismiss you, and we're going to work the altar for some of you. You know what grieves me? And I'm going to say this humbly. I love, I binge watch certain things. I'm the type of guy, you know, my wife will pick up a TV series or the people around me pick up TV. TV and if I miss the first episode, I'm not watching it because it, I hate people trying to explain to me in episode four, oh, man, oh, you got to just, I can't stand it. So I, when my wife picks up a TV series like that, I just disappear for a month until it's over uh, or I can binge watch it. There is something I can binge watch all day. I don't care what y'all feel about it. Y'all can call her a witch, a warlock, whatever. I love Ayana Van Zandt. Now, I don't agree with her doctrine, but I'm going to tell you why. I feel like she's doing what a lot of our churches refuse to do. I watch that stuff. Part of what you see is how fearful controlling people are. The root of that spirit of control is a spirit of fear. One of the manifestations of fear. And because things have gotten out of control, they got to get things under their control again. One of the most powerful things you can do is tell your mother, no. Tell your daddy, no. And what they'll do is they'll try to manipulate you, coerce you. I raised you. That's fine. Thank you. But it can turn into manipulation and control. Honor is not something that should ever be forced on you. If it's not an act of your will, it's not honor at all. You've been hypnotized into doing it. And you should, amen, praise the Lord. Praise God. Some of, that's what's wrong with some of y'all marriages is your mama. Especially, they ain't, you know, if they uh, widowed and, and ain't doing nothing but sitting up braiding their hair all day and they want to tell you how to treat your wife. And, but that's why, and, and listen, every family structure is different. But listen, I, 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 when y'all invite y'all in-laws to live with y'all, and you can't even get busy in the room without uh, seeing if Big Mama is asleep or not. I can't have that. I like adventure. My mama could never come in my house and live. I would be so ashamed of repenting of the stuff I do to my wife in that house. I don't want, I'm being very honest. I don't want that. And I also don't want to have to explain why we make the decisions we do. Why we do that. Because when you have that, then mama, like, why you say that to that boy like that? Why? And then your kids will wisen up. Y'all start going to your mom and dad like, can you do that? Da, 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 da. And now you are all surrounded with stuff that controls you. Y'all are uncomfortable. And you know why? Because I'm dealing with a lot of witchcraft in the black family. There is a lot of witchcraft that operates in our families. Amen. Sorry. I'm going to dismiss you and I'm going to pray for many of you. That's either in this spirit, you got a fear of authority, you got a, a, issues with authority figures, you just don't do well with that. Or you've had hurt that's turned into witchcraft. Some of the most powerful witches in the world got hurt and they wanted a way to access power. If you understand even the broader uh, sources of witchcraft, those that go to the extreme of it, like um, water witching or root working um, or those that use their menstrual blood to try to control men. These are all, yeah, they'll make spaghetti. They'll make chili for you, and it's a form of witchcraft. They believe that that's a way to make you fall in love. They don't know nothing about that, I guess. Okay. Brothers, a single lady come up to you talking about something. I made you some spaghetti. You better push it back. Thank you. Get that thing to your dog immediately. Nope. The devil is a liar. Witchcraft. I got you a little red velvet cake. Nah, ma'am. Nope. <laughs> it's real. I know y'all don't think there's people out there like that, but it's a very real thing. Witchcraft is real. I'm going to dismiss you and I'm going to pray for some of you. Um, we're going to do some deliverance from this issue seriously and you leaders if you ain't got nothing else to do tonight don't you 
twist your hips up out of here. I just gave you an instruction to cast out devils. If you disobey, you are, it's, you're one of the ones who's violating authority. I told you to stay to cast out devils. So unless you got a fever and dying or your knee is broken, you're going to cast out the devil. If you're tired, join the human race. We all tired. We all have been through stuff. Drink some water. But we're going to labor and we're going to minister to God's people. Father, I thank you for this word and I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for what you're doing in this house. I praise you, Lord, for this season where we are learning the power of authority and how authority is the way to change and the way to upgrade and the way to advancement. Help us to live as men submitted to authority, as women submitted to authority, and as men and women who are worthy of greater authority to be used in the kingdom of God. In the glorious name of Jesus, I honor you and I praise you. Amen. All right, if you're leaving, you can be dismissed. If you are, yeah, if you're leaving, <laughs> that was your benediction. If you want prayer, uh, <laughs> you mean tell me all y'all under witchcraft? <laughs> if you're leaving, this is your dismissal. If you're staying for ministry, <laughs> you can come to <laughs> tell my mass deliverance. Wait a minute. Is this serious? <laughs>